somebody in your house has a fever, a really, really high temperature. But thankfully, you have some paracetamol or some aspirin or an anti-inflammatory, right? Hi everyone, welcome back to Health Rethink. One of our biggest aims is to help people renovate their health. And if you're doing a renovation project, you need to know which building supplies to have available and what you need and what plan you're going to follow to do that renovation. When it comes to our bodies, it's the same thing. We need to know what the body is constructed of so that we can figure out which supplies to provide so that the body can actually heal itself and rebuild any damage. Now, one of the topics that we discuss over and over with our patients and one of the questions I keep getting is, what do I do for a fever? The temperature is really, really high. My child's temperature is high or my husband is really sick and he's got a really bad fever and I can't seem to get it down. I've been giving medications, I've given paracetamol or I've given aspirin or we've taken med lemon and the fever doesn't want to come down. What do we do? One of the most common reasons why people feel worried when they have a fever is because they don't actually know what the fever is there for. What does it do? Why does it happen? If we understand this, most of the time we can know and figure out how to help the body even if we haven't got a medical degree or studied any kind of health care. Why do we even have a fever? What happens in the body? Well, we're not going to get very technical about this today, but I'd like to give you some very, very basic simple bits of information that might help you understand this a bit better. When our bodies are at ease and we are not fighting any kind of inflammation or infection, we usually have a body temperature ranging between 36.4 degrees Celsius going up to about 37.2 degrees Celsius and that's considered normal temperature or normal body temperature. When we are sick, say for instance you have an infection and microorganisms have started flourishing and growing in excess in a part of your body. Let's take, for example, you have a chest infection and you have um, an infection in your lungs. In the case of a lung infection, where bacteria are in overgrowth inside the lungs, your immune system detects this. Your body is designed to figure out when something is wrong. And there are so many different kinds of receptors, chemical receptors and other receptors that actually detect the overgrowth of a harmful microorganism in your body. And when your body detects harmful bacteria growing in your lungs, your immune system starts reacting. But your immune system is not made up of one kind of type of cell. If you think of the armies in a war situation, there are so many different soldiers doing different things. There are soldiers in watchtowers. There are soldiers specifically trained for sharpshooting. There are other soldiers who are in the front lines, others doing technical work, some are looking after the weapons, some are sorting out other resources, some soldiers are working undercover, others are doing you know, different duties. Each and every kind of soldier is trained for that particular job. These immune cells work together to fight this infection. And one of the many strategies that they employ is by sending chemical messages to the brain to actually trigger your thermostat to adjust. There are areas in your brain that control your body temperature, that keep it within a normal level, and we call that process of homeostasis. That area of the brain is responsible for making sure that when your body temperature drops, you actually do things like put on a jacket or put on some warm socks and some warm shoes. You do things that help bring that low body temperature back to normal. When you're too hot, your brain tells you and instructs you or gives you the motivation to take some layers off or to open a window or to move to a cooler area or to get out of the sun. So that particular area of the brain is there to help keep your body temperature within that normal range. However, in the situation of an infection where the immune system is shouting out, we need to fight this infection, certain things are triggered so that your brain actually adjusts the temperature that it's trying to aim for. And in that scenario, that temperature goes up much higher. Your body is actually trying to push your temperature up really high for a particular reason. And that reason gives us the answer to how we should deal with a fever. One of the biggest reasons your body is designed to push your body temperature up 
when you are fighting an infection is because it actually triggers a number of processes that help to fight the infection. When your body temperature is elevated, it actually damages the bacteria or the microorganisms that have caused that infection to begin with. And your body is actually able to adjust your body temperature to a particular level depending on the organism that has caused the infection. When certain organisms have caused the infection that are more prone to damage during heat, your body aims to go up above that heat so that those organisms can no longer multiply or flourish. The other thing that happens when you have an elevated body temperature is that your immune system is triggered to actually act more strongly and act a little bit faster. Your bone marrow is triggered to release immune cells faster and in that way there are more army soldiers sent into the bloodstream to help to fight this infection. Now when you have an elevated temperature that makes it harder for the germs to multiply, that triggers your immune system to act more strongly, that causes increased numbers of immune cells to be released from your bone marrow. My biggest question is not how do I deal with a fever, but why would I want to bring that fever down before my body detects that it is safe to do so? You see, we need to start trusting that our creator has made us in a certain way. He's built in mechanisms into our bodies to help us fight infections that we don't have the knowledge to fight. Your immune system is able to detect when it has achieved the goal it wanted to. When the viral counts or the bacterial counts have actually started dropping, your immune system is able to detect that. When the immune cells that are being released from the bone marrow have actually been released and your immune cell count has been increased sufficiently, your body is able to detect that and then the brain knows it is safe to bring that body temperature back down to normal levels. So the biggest thing we need to act on is not actually to try and bring that fever down, but to help the body achieve the goals faster. How can we do that? How can I help my body to release extra numbers of immune cells faster? There are a few things that I can do. Number one, I can do contrast hydrotherapy sessions. Contrast hydrotherapy has been known to help the body trigger a similar immune response than what it would be doing during a state of fever, but it helps to do it a little bit faster. When I have a contrast shower where I alternate between hot and cold water temperatures for three to seven cycles, I'm able to actually increase my white blood cell count by up to 40%, depending on what my body's condition is in. That is an incredible boost in immune response. And when your body detects all those extra blood cells and those extra white blood cells being released, it will very quickly realize that it no longer needs to have the fever at such a high level, but it can bring the fever down because the immune system has already achieved its desired number of soldiers. The other thing that you're able to do is to take herbs that actually boost your immune system, and there are a number of those like echinacea. You can take things like garlic and onion that contain quercetin, and there are a few others which I will list on the screen as well. You can also take immune boosting concoctions like lim lemon and ginger um, combinations, lemon and honey combinations, onion and honey combinations. Of course, the next question we need to answer is, is it safe to allow my body to remain with an elevated temperature? Many, many parents have been warned that they have to bring the fever down because the the fever in itself is dangerous, that it can cause seizures or brain damage. Is this really true? In most cases, the fever is not dangerous. In the vast majority of cases, children as well as adults can tolerate elevated body temperatures for an extended period of time, as long as they have certain other conditions met. For instance, a fever is dangerous if the person is dehydrated. If you or your child have an elevated body temperature, but you're dehydrated, this can result in problems. When you have a high body temperature, your body requires extra moisture and fluid to hydrate cells, in particular in your kidneys and in your brain, to prevent those organs from malfunctioning. So dehydration during a fever is dangerous, not the fever in itself. In addition to that, one of the other key things we have to remember is that the body needs to be able to do the functions it's trying to do. It is trying to have an increased immune response, 
it is trying to create conditions that actually dampen the growth and flourishing of bacteria and other harmful microorganisms. And in order to do that, it has to be able to detox. Now this is a topic that we will make another video on because it's a topic on its own. But the one key thing I can mention to you here is that your body detoxes most efficiently when it is in a fasting state and your liver is actually unable to work on detoxing processes when it's also busy working on metabolic functions related to digesting a meal. One of the safest things you can do when somebody has a fever is to help their body trigger the right responses. As we've already mentioned, you can use the mechanisms to help the body um, build that immune response and increase that immune response. And the other really, really important thing you need to do is keep them hydrated because if they are well hydrated, they are not in danger of negative complications through that fever. And the third most important thing when somebody has a fever is to make sure that they are fasting. When somebody has a really high temperature, they should not be eating. And under no condition should you force feed a sick person who is saying, I don't have an appetite, I don't feel hungry. The low appetite that commonly presents itself during a fever, during a condition like flus or common colds, is a protective mechanism built into our bodies because it is ideal for us to be fasting when the body is trying to detox. So allow that body to fast, allow the fever to do what it's meant to do and keep that body really well hydrated. Now the last tip that I want to share with you is that you can actually help the body reach those goals even faster by actually helping the body reach that aimed fever temperature a little bit quicker. How can you do this? If you are experiencing symptoms of a fever, you have those shivers and you're feeling sweaty and you're feeling really, really low on energy, instead of bringing the fever down, which means that your body is going to repeatedly try to push the temperature up all the time, you can actually help the body achieve the higher temperature a little bit quicker, try and aim to keep it there while you remain really well hydrated and see what the response is. I know it sounds crazy, but in many cases we have seen that if somebody realizes their body is trying to increase its core temperature, if they actually help the body achieve that core temperature faster, help the body to stay at that core temperature for a little bit longer, they often find that they only need to go through one fever cycle and then they don't have repeated cycles of fever. When we interrupt a fever, when we bring it down artificially, we often find that the body keeps trying to push it up. So they often have 24 to 48 hours where the body keeps pushing that body temperature up or keeps trying to do that. If we help the body to achieve that temperature, often one or two cycles of the fever is enough to achieve what the body is trying to do. And it often squashes the infection really, really quickly. How can you do that? When you see that your body is trying to push its core temperature up, you can actually have your contrast um, shower and alternate between the hot and cold temperatures, end off with cold water, which believe it or not will help you increase your blood circulation and boost your immune response. Then you get into a really warm bed with many blankets and many sheets over it and you allow for your body to stay warm for 10 minutes to even half an hour. And during that time, you actually aim to stay warm enough to, to be sweating. It's often helpful to stay in a bed during this time that you can easily strip. So having some plastic sheeting underneath the sheets or something that you can quickly remove and get back into a clean bed can be quite helpful. But when you've had your contrast shower and you get into a really warm sweat bed, or we call it a sweat bed because you get into there with the aim of staying warm enough to remain on the sweating side of, of the spectrum, you can actually help to break that fever in the end. Staying in that warm bed, allowing your body to have this episode of sweating helps to flush out some of the negative things. It increases your ability to detox. It increases the numbers of mature white blood cells that are being released into the bloodstream. And ultimately, if you stay hydrated during this time period, making sure that you've got water to drink throughout the process or a herbal tea to sip on while you're in the bed and you're resting for that period, Many times we find that when people have had one session like that, after that, the fever doesn't come back. If you have any other questions about what you should do during a fever or 
wanting to clarify some of the danger signs people have mentioned that you are worried about, please remember to share with us in the comment section and I'll try to make some more videos where I answer these questions. For now, I'm going to try to end this off, even though there's so much more that we can say about this. But remember to stay in touch. Let me know what else you want to understand about this topic and we'll try and cover it in the next video. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.